record. All right, so one second for some technical stuff here. Sometimes this works and sometimes it doesn't. If we can't go live, then we will record and we'll, we'll post it again later. All right. Okay, I think we are just about ready to go. Let's go live. Cool, okay, so this is working. So we will be also live on Facebook on my uh, Adventures with Sarah Facebook page. Okay, done redirecting. Okay, so back to Zoom. All right, you guys, so uh, welcome everybody. I would just like to uh, welcome you to our, our next Lunch and Learn. Um, this is our, um, uh, this is our, what, third or fourth Lunch and Learn, which is very exciting. Uh, so we are going to today be um, speaking with a friend of mine in Palermo, who is uh, an author and a tour guide and incredibly talented. Uh, she's probably, I would say, one of the foremost experts on Sic Sicilian history, especially writing in the English language. So welcome to Jackie Alio. Hello, Jackie. Hi, Sarah. Hello, everybody. Hello, everybody out there. And uh, welcome to Palermo, <laughs> what <did> I say? <laughs> so how has the lockdown been treating you in Sicily? Oh, a lot of pizza made at home and lasagna and baked bread and sweets. And <laughs> we've been cooking and baking. In fact, one of the things that were impossible to find for, for weeks uh, when the lockdown began was um, yeast, you know, yeah. yeast for baking bread and flour. Now the, they're, they're, they're making more of it. So uh, a lot of people are just staying at home and uh, some people, I've actually spoken to some friends of mine who had never baked bread in their life and they've told me, oh, I, baked, I, made, I made some homemade bread. <laughs> <laughs> what, you're telling me that Italian women don't make everything from scratch? Are you kidding? Yeah. I'm, I'm not kidding, Sarah, I'm not kidding. Sometimes men are better at baking bread or making pizza at home than some women. Wow. At, in Italy. Times yeah, have changed. No, no, people have been learning, they've been teaching their kids. It's like a hands-on hands sessions for kids in between, uh, you know, schooling uh, on, on their, you know, on computer, streaming, <laughs> anyway. Oh, that's fantastic. So how, and Things you got changed. You got to get out, right? Yeah, since Monday, uh, we've had a little bit more, um, you know, some restrictions have been lifted. So we could actually go for a longer walk. Um, I, I, haven't, I haven't been able to get into town because I live just in the outskirts uh, of the city. And um, I haven't been able to get and go and visit the beautiful streets and sites of Palermo for two months. Okay, so I'm going to do that next week. Good. Now that awesome. some of the restrictions restrictions are lifted, but not completely. We still have to go around with a form uh, stating why we're leaving the house. I don't know if it's been like that in the U.S. No, it hasn't. We can't not leave our homes without this form stating that we're going out for an urgent reason or we need to go uh, do groceries. And now you could even write that you're going out to see your family member or your boyfriend. <laughs> so since, since Monday, this is possible. Okay. Well, it's getting better. I, I have seen all these videos of better. people in Milan that were out for aperitivo yesterday. That was crazy. We, we haven't had much of that here. Actually, I have to say that the Sicilians have been really, really good. We've, we've behaved uh, properly. People are very careful. Um, in, and in fact, we have a low uh, we have a low number of cases. 
Okay. okay. We've always had a low number of cases here. We're, we're lucky. We're fortunate. Yeah. Okay. Sicily's done but pretty well. It's, it's been crazy. I mean, it's crazy all over the world right now. I know I've been listening to the news regarding what's happening in the U.S. and elsewhere, but um, I can't believe something like this is happening. <laughs> okay. I know. I thought I'd be hanging out with you right now. Sure we will. <laughs> Instead, we're in this crazy, uh, I don't know, science, science fiction movie, uh, science fiction horror movie. <laughs> That's what it feels like. I know. I, I, it's, it's a little strange because I, I, I really, I should be in Sicily right now, but. I know, I know. I know. So, this is high season here. Yeah, I and, know. And we have the sun shining people. But this week, people have been able to go to Mondello Beach for oh. a swim. Wow. It, it, it's we've had really warm weather and this, this is the first the first week when people actually have been allowed to go as far uh, to the beach okay from from here but you know in, in Palermo the beach is is not just uh, by the water <laughs> you have to go to the beach yeah anyway. Mandela is so beautiful yeah I was hoping to spend um, the summer in Sicily with my kids but I guess we're spending it in Seattle, which is not quite, in my opinion, not quite as beautiful, but that's, that's well, another, maybe that's another 2021, 2021 might be the year for that. Who knows? Yes, I think so. <laughs> so um, just so people, the, the, those of you joining us who don't know, um, Jackie has authored a series of guidebooks. She is um, the local guide that I work with when I do a tour in Sicily, and she's really um, well regarded and she knows so much. I mean, this is your passion. Sicilian history is yes. your passion. Yes, Sicily. Mm -hmm. And how long have you been doing research on Sicilian history? Well, uh, in the beginning, it started, you know, I've been guiding for a long time, over 25 years. And, you know, I always wanted to be very well informed. And I'm, sometimes I didn't find the right books out there, not even in libraries regarding certain subjects. So about 20 years ago, I actually uh, started to do some of my own research. It was personal. Then about 15, 14 years ago, some of that research came to use when I started writing on a kind of, um, before blogs existed, uh, a kind of, a, it's called bestofsicily.com, um, like a magazine, an online magazine. I started writing articles for that, but my first book came out in 2013. Okay, The Peoples of Sicily. Which yeah. Well, and I would I would absolutely second that that um, when uh, Alfio and I were writing the Sicily book, it was impossible to find anything in English. I mean, there were maybe three or four books outside of your books. I think that I found three or four books in English. So yeah. for the most part, we had to either go back to the Italian texts. I had to order a lot mm -hmm. of books in Italian and kind of work through yeah. those. Um, and we had to do a lot of research that was more on site kind of research because just there's not a lot written about Sicily. Right. So that's what really makes you somebody who's unique and exceptional because you, you're writing not just about Sicily, but in English. And I mean, in English, yes, all my books are in English. Yeah, okay. well, and now having written a book about Sicily, let me tell you, it's no small feat because trying to get information about Sicily and getting it accurately and figuring out mm -hmm. everything is like virtually like it's all it's the sisyphusian kind of you know task it's almost yeah no it's tough i mean we have some really good records uh historical records in the in the archives and stuff but you have to go and look for it and you know in my case i've actually had to travel to to get some of the information out to spain and france and malta and england because sicily as you know is so connected with all the world all the mediterranean all of europe um historically and some of those documents are elsewhere today. Basically. Yeah. Well, and part, yeah, part of that is because of the domination um, of Sicily. So for those of uh, for people that are joining us may not know um, about sort of the very, very rich and complicated history of Sicily, um, but could you kind of tell us what you, what you find most intriguing about it? You are Sicilian and American. Um, right. So it's, right. I'm sure it's part, partially a heritage thing, but what is it that intrigues you so much about Sicily? Uh, it, it, it's complicated. I mean, a bit of everything. Um, because as you said, I am Sicilian. My parents were born in Sicily. I grew up as a Sicilian in the U.S. And, and so being Sicilian has always been a part of me. My parents were proud uh, to be Sicilian um and italian but sicilian first but what intrigues me is is i i guess not just the food and and traditions and customs and strong family uh, 
connections which are important, but the history. It's it's the history. The the fact that when you when you look through the history, you read about it, you learn about it, you realize that we are truly a melting pot here in Sicily. Uh, my father had blondish hair, blue eyes, and his siblings called him Inormano, okay, the Norman. Uh, well, I've got some cousins that look like they just flew over from Morocco. I mean, we're a mix of everybody who was who was here, and that's that's it's this this diversity that you find in our genes, in our history, and then of course our food, our recipes, our language. Uh, it's all based on the history, though. That's what really intrigues me. Yeah, and we have a question that why is Sicily connected to those other countries? And that's because of all of the dominations. How many, 18 different dominations of the island? At least, <laughs> okay. Yeah. It, because then we had like some sub-dominations, uh, but it goes all the way back to prehistoric times. Um, the original peoples of, in Sicily were the Sicanians, and they apparently came over from today Spain, the Iberian Peninsula, okay? Um, and that was like maybe 20,000 years ago, if not, if not uh, even earlier. Uh, and then we had this, this, the so-called Sicils and the Elimians and the Greeks, the Romans, the Phoenicians or Carthaginians. Uh, it goes all the way back. And, and so that, that connects us with all the Mediterranean. And then of course, we got people from way up, from, from North Africa, okay? The Muslims who were mostly Berbers, uh, there were Jews here, uh, uh, Arab Jews, mostly from North Africa. And then, of course, the Normans, <laughs> the Normans with their, you know, the tall Normans with their red hair, blonde hair, blue eyes, green eyes. Um, so the, that Viking blood, Norse blood <laughs> that mix into ours. And, and of course, the, the Germans, the French, the Spanish. And, and then think of the Spanish, we had the Spanish Aragonese, the Catalonians, then the Bourbon dynasty. Uh, so quite a mix. And of course, the Lombards. It used to be that the Lombards, the Northern Italians, were the ones immigrating to Sicily during the Middle Ages. Okay, they were, they were brought here by King Roger II and then Frederick II, our medieval kings, uh, to work um, to help colonize farmland. Okay. And it, it, for, for those of you who don't know, it, it sounds uh, a little funny today because uh, un unfortunately after 1860, it was the Sicilians and Southern Italianers who were immigrating to Northern Italy, to Lombardy. Okay, but in the past, this was the, where the wealth was, um, the fertile land, the commerce, the trade, basically. Yeah, and I think that's one of the great misconceptions. All this diversity. Yeah, people have a misconception, I think, about Sicily because uh, in the American sort of mindset of Sicily, I think people see see the Godfather, they see this, the other kind of cliches about what Sicily is, or they come from a Sicilian family that was poor and emigrated to the United States to try and escape famine or you know poverty. But what a lot of people don't realize is that Sicily actually was one of the most wealthy places in the Mediterranean for multiple generations right. that's that's exactly it okay yeah. for multiple generations this is where uh, people were immigrating to sicily um, especially during the middle ages but even even up until the 18th century okay we had uh people um, entrepreneurs migrating from southern italy like the florio family but also from from northern italy coming down to sicily to open up businesses here or coming over from England uh, as entrepreneurs. Okay, in fact, the Marsala winery started here, but this was a very, very wealthy land. And um, it, it, it was the reason why the House of Savoy, the Piedmontese, who then became the Kings of Italy, the first, the, the Kings of Italy in 1861, um, that's why they wanted Sicily and Southern Italy because of all the, 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 um, the resources and commerce and, um, and the land, okay, the fertile land. Which answers the question that somebody had posed here, why does Sicily belong to Italy now rather than another country? But it had everything to do with the resurgimento, the unification of Italy in the 19th century. Right, 
yeah. in during the 19th century um, you see as 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 some of you may know during the during the 19th century before the risorgimento before italian unification uh, sicily and naples okay which also was part of the so-called kingdom of the two sicilies until 1861 this was the wealthier part of italy um, just just naples alone the capital by then naples was the capital of uh, southern Italy and, and Sicily. Uh, Naples alone, the wealth there was uh, more than all of northern Italy combined, okay? Um, to not mention the Papal States, okay, which were separate, a separate kingdom, a separate state. Um, and, and so uh, it was obvious that there could not have been a, a, a real unification of Italy uh, without the southern half of Italy. Okay, Sicily and Naples, which was the wealthier part. Okay, um, this wealth disappeared eventually. <laughs> uh, let's not get into this because, as you know, it's a very touchy topic for me. Um, but unfortunately, um, many of our woes started after 1861 here in Sicily and southern Italy because that wealth was taken away. It was used for other reasons. Uh, child labor started in Sicily because the, um, the Savoys and the Brits, who were at that point their allies, wanted to uh, quarry, uh, extract as much sulfur from Sicily as possible. During the 19th century, Sicily had 80% of the sulfur uh, monopoly. Um, and, and so children were employed uh, so that they could go into the shafts underground to extract the sulfur. Okay, obviously they had a very short life at that point. This is one of the reasons why so many Sicilians fled. Um, Sicilians, some Sicilian families put their children on, on ships to send over to the U.S. for a better life. And they had to flee from, from this type of uh, poverty and, um, and child slavery. Yeah, and there's a so that that's one of the kind of origin stories of why it is that there are so many Americans. They, how how many millions do they say of Americans have Sicilian roots? Twenty twenty three million Americans. Okay, okay, just in the U.S. Okay, yeah. not talking about Canada. Twenty three or twenty five million Americans have uh, Sicil some Sicilian descent. Um, so yeah, quite quite a bit. Okay, to not mention people in Canada or southern or South America, Central America, Australia. Sicilians went all over the world um, because immigration was the only solution for them. Um, the Italian kingdom uh, up until World War II, uh, when it was uh, eliminated, uh, destroyed uh, by 1946, when Italy became a democratic republic, uh, the Italian kingdom uh, was uh, using uh, taking away all our wealth, um, our future. Um, they, they confiscated even church properties uh, to get more money. Uh, not, to think of the, not thinking of the fact that many of the priests and nuns were teachers even for poor children. Farmers, uh, poor families would send their children to these uh, schools run by nuns or, or, or priests at convents and monasteries. Um, and kids would learn how to read and write. Uh, girls would learn how to read and write too, how to embroider, how to sew. Um, and this was, this disappeared uh, in the 1860s when church property was confiscated. The new Italian government, the, the Savoy um, dynasty had promised to open up public schools throughout Italy, but Sicily did not see any of these public schools until the early 20th century, okay. They were obviously opened up in Northern Italy together with industries, okay, with our money. But we didn't see public schools until about the time of fascism. Well, and this I think, goes back to a, a kind of explain why it is that there is, there's a couple of reasons that the North and the South of Italy are so different. I think that a lot of people understand that those are very different. And part of the origin story of that is that they literally were two different countries, a little more than 150 years ago, that's number one. So they have a completely different ethnic right. background. But also the reason, a lot of the reasons stem from the fact that the original 
royal family of Italy was actually from the far, far north. And so they had nothing to do with the Southerners at all. And so they had no, no. interest in investing money and time into the South. Honestly, the Savoys really had nothing to do with people in Veneto or in Tuscany or in Lombardy. They were Piedmontese uh, that included by then a part of France and they were also kings of Sardinia. And in fact, if you listen to Piedmontese today, as, as I'm sure you know, it has a very strong French, uh, guttural French uh, accent and it some does. words from French. Yeah. Um, and in fact, the first capital of Italy was in Turin, in Piedmont. Then it was moved to Florence, then Rome, which was more in the middle. Um, but if things had gone differently and we had united, because I, I am for Italian unification, okay, don't get me wrong, but if we had united without a bloody civil war, but in a peaceful way. Um, many historians believe today that we would not be speaking Tuscan Italian in Italy, but Neapolitan, because that was the main language, okay? Sicilian and Neapolitan have many similarities, but Neapolitan was the, the main language in Central and Southern Italy. Uh, but instead, history went differently. <laughs> And, and here we are speaking more of a Tuscan Italian, even though it's been standardized. Yeah, so Florentine yeah. Italian, yeah. So um, one of your great interests in your writing is not just the history of Sicily, but more specifically um, the, the history of women in Sicily. Mm -hmm. uh, so what started your fascination with the, your research into women in Sicily? So again, um, what lured me, attracted me into writing about Sicilian women is that hardly anything is written about them, hardly anything at all in, in any language. I'm not just talking about uh, English. I mean, yes, slowly there are some Italian female writers mostly that are starting to write something about um, women in, in Italy or Sicily and even a few uh, historical women. But Sicily had some of the most powerful queens in Europe, okay? Uh, for example, I wrote um, a book, the first biography on a woman, a queen of Sicily named Margaret, Margaret of Navarra, because uh, she was originally from uh, north, northeastern, northeastern Spain, Navarra, Pamplona, uh, that area. And she happened to marry one of our Norman kings, William I of Sicily, son of the great Roger II of Sicily. And this woman, Margaret, uh, at a certain point she was widowed and um, she was regent for five entire years because her son was still a minor. Uh, the, new, the future King William II was only 12 years old when his father died. So at a certain point, Margaret had a kingdom that spanned from Naples down to Calabria, Sicily, Malta, which was part of Sicily too at the time. And what, what's, what's really amazing is not just the fact that she um, was able to uh, govern in, um, in an incredible way, considering that she was a woman and it was the Middle Ages, but her subjects were multi-religious and multi-ethnic. There were many Muslims still in Sicily during the 12th century, but also Jews and Greek Byzantine Christians, and of course the Normans who were Catholic. And she was able to keep the kingdom together, even though there were many difficult moments uh, during her, her rule. Uh, so why, why do I find it shocking that nobody had written her biography until I published Margaret, Queen of Sicily a few years ago? Because this woman um, was, in Italian, we say consuogera. I don't think the word consuogera exists. She was the mother of William II, who married Joanna, the Plantagenet of England here in Sicily. Joanna was the daughter of Henry II and Eleanor Aquitaine. So Eleanor and Margaret of Sicily were consuogere. They were both uh, mother-in-laws, okay, <laughs> because their children got married. There's no word in English for that. No, I don't okay. think so. <laughs> Co-mother-in-laws. Yeah. And many, many books, biographies, had been written on Eleanor Aquitaine. She didn't even have a tenth of the power that Queen Margaret of Sicily had. Okay. Nobody had written her biography until I decided to, to do it. 
So um, we had some amazing women here um, with, with a lot of power. But I, I've also in book written about um, more common women. For example, a Jewish woman during the, mid during the 15th century after um, the Spanish Inquisition started, her name was Caterina a Monteverde, and how she was forced to convert to the Catholic Church, but she kept um, all her Jewish traditions. And for this, she almost lost her life. Wow. Okay, so um, I've written about quite a few women. <laughs> anyway. You have, and I, I think it's kind of fascinating that it seems to me that from all the reading I've done, I've read, of course, your books, which, by the way, her books are fantastic, and they're very, very readable. So I know they're, they're very complicated histories, and she's done a lot of great research, but eminently readable, so I highly recommend them, uh, and they're available on Amazon, just as a, a to let you know. Um, also on Barnes & Noble and other... Yeah. Okay. Um, so one of the things I find kind of strange is that so many of these powerful and interesting women have been from Sicily. I mean, but more so than other parts of Europe. And I wonder why that is. Do you have any insight as to why it is so that Sicily seems to have such a, a, a more accepting attitude towards women, like female leadership? Well, um, to answer that, Sarah, we, we need to remember the fact that under the Normans, we had something called Sicilian female succession, which did not exist in Northern Italy. Um, it, what came back, it came back from the Normans. It, it, it was rooted in Norman history. But here in Sicily, if um, a king died and there was no male heir next in line, a woman could have become either regent until her son came of age or actually reignant, actually queen. Okay, and that happened. For example, in the case of Constance, Queen Constance of Hauteville, who was the mother of Frederick II, okay? And she actually took power in her own hands even before, um, um, even before she was pregnant with Frederick II. So um, that's one of the reasons why we see all these women who had a lot of power in their hands. Then another reason is that our kings, married um, important women from important dynasties um, to create a stronger kingdom here in Sicily. So you got, we got women from, from Spain, in particular Aragon and Catalonia, but also Seville. Uh, we got women um, from, from England, from France, from Germany, Belgium, Northern, Northern Italy, Lombardy. Okay, for example, Frederick II's mother was from Lombardy. Um, and, and think of it, one woman uh, who was betrothed to King William II, but then he didn't marry her, was Maria, the daughter of, em of Emperor Manuel Comenes of Constantinople. Okay, so very important women. Um, then the other question you asked, um, they were tolerated. <laughs> they were tolerated because they became regents or queens and, and so, and they had absolute power. That doesn't mean that there was such an open attitude towards them, uh, but the law was the law. Sicilian female succession did exist in Sicily for a very long time, okay. Um, and I think that in general, in, in a lot of different cases, through history at least, um, there has been a more progressive attitude towards women in, in Sicily and possibly part on of enough. that. On, on enough, Sarah. On enough, in certain, in certain ways. I mean, maybe not okay. exactly today, <laughs> but uh, historically speaking, and uh, I have to wonder just as an observer of the history there, if a lot of that ha stems from the, the Normans who ha kind of instituted the attitude of cultural acceptance, you know, and integration. What do you think? Maybe it's maybe not. It's probably very strongly connected to the idea of cultural ethnic acceptance because of this mix. Yeah. Yes, because of this mix, which today is happening again. Okay, Sicilians who are already a mix of a melting pot of everybody who was here. Um, now, we it, for the, over the past 20, 25 years, we've been um, accepting new. I, I wouldn't call them all just immigrants, but even refugees from all over the world, okay, from North Africa, from the Eastern uh, Mediterranean, from Bangladesh and India and Sub-Saharan Africa, 
um, but even immigrants from China. So it's happening again, because it had stopped happening for a while. Then we had what I call the dark ages of Sicily. So our golden age, uh, an age of tolerance was the middle ages. Okay, a little bit different from what happened elsewhere in Europe. Then our dark age happened during the late 15th century when um, the Spanish Inquisition started because Spain was united, we were part of Spain and, and it happened. King Ferdinando, uh, Castile and um, Isabella, actually Isabella Castile and Ferdinando of Aragon, um, anyway, they united and the Inquisition started and that intolerance lasted until the Enlightenment. Um, the Inquisition was not abolished in Sicily until 1782. Oh. And then what happened? Then <laughs> we could have evolved towards a more enlightened um, way for a while we did, but unfortunately, a number of events happened uh, coming uh, coming together then with fascism too. Okay, and in that case, our Jews who were back, some of our Jews were back, were forced to leave. Uh, otherwise, they would have been sent to concentration camps. Okay, we had a lot of Jews in Sicily uh, when, uh, in 1938, until 1938, uh, including university teachers and professors and entrepreneurs from Northern Europe, and they were forced to leave. Um, but now things are happening again. We have this tolerance that's really innate. It's, it's in, in us. It's, it's in our DNA, Sarah. It's, it's really in our DNA. It is. And <laughs> Sicilians are considered amongst the most... Um, tolerant um, people with, with the new immigrants and refugees who have been coming over. Okay. So we have a question here. Um, how about tolerance of Americans? <laughs> so if, if uh, I were, for example, to buy a, a house in Sicily, would I be accepted? Sicilians love Americans, Sarah. <laughs> it's, 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 you know, we almost became an American, not colony, but like Puerto Rico after yeah. World War II. In, 19, in 1943, Sicily was out of the war two years before the rest of Italy, thanks to the Allied forces, to the Americans. And um, many of those Americans who came to Sicily to liberate us from the fascists and from the Nazis were Italian Americans. Okay. Um, so they, they were like our cousins, our relatives coming here and freeing us. And, and so while Italy was still at war, um, the Sicilians decided that we wanted to join America. Uh, if it hadn't been for the fact that the last king of Italy, of, uh, Umberto of Savoy, signed a decree stating that we could have become a, an autonomous region, and we did, we probably would have become part of America. So uh, even though many years have passed since that moment, 1946, uh, nonetheless, um, America is still viewed as um, something that's akin to us. It's very, very close to Sicilian. So you could buy a house here. Don't worry. Well, and You'll just from my own personal experience, I've been, um, I've been coming to Sicily for, gosh, maybe ten years now, and not as, uh, not as long as northern parts of Italy. And just in terms of my social integration. It, t it took me, like my Tuscan friends, some of them, it's taken me 20 years to become close to them and be invited to their homes. <laughs> Whereas I really yes. feel like in Sicily, I was able to, um, to really integrate. And I feel like, yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm really rather integrated into a family now there. I mean, I feel like my family, a lot of people that are very close to me are in Sicily. So just from my own personal experience, it takes time and language because frankly, not a lot of people in Sicily speak English. Uh, but I have found the people in Sicily to be some of the most warm, loving, inviting, like, yeah, you're part of the family. Come on, we're going to a family reunion mm -hmm. and you're invited kind of thing. And so, yeah, that's how yeah. we are. We're, we're, as we say in Italian, molto alla mano. Yeah. Uh, you're part of family. If, if you want to be with us, we're, we'll take you to our family events. And <laughs> it's, it's something, I, I don't know, maybe that's also our uh, Greek roots and um, North, you know, Berber, North African roots. This, this thing of being very welcoming even towards foreigners. And if you want to be here, it means, for us, it means that you want to become part of what we are, okay? 
uh, most people don't don't look at a foreigner as um, somebody intruding into our lives, but somebody who wants to be here. In fact, um, I don't know, you're right. Sicilians in general are, are more, uh, especially in small towns, yeah. especially in small towns. Yeah, I mean, just thinking about it, it actually makes my heart swell because I miss it so much. I miss everybody so much because it really, I, a part yeah. of my, my heart is on that island at all times. And um, it's, it's, what it, it's just such a, it's a magical place. And I think that if you feel it and you feel that connection, you know, you really feel it. Some people maybe go there and they don't, they don't feel it, but I know very few people who've traveled with me that haven't left there affected by that experience because it's just such a soulful place. Yeah. And maybe it's that complicated tapestry of humanity that does that because everybody that, you go, that I've taken yeah. to Sicily can find a way to connect with, with it somehow on some level. You're right. Yeah, it's, it, there's something here for everybody in any case. And even Sicilians like to have, you know, new ideas coming in from abroad. Uh, I see it with some of our restaurants. Um, we, for example, there's some foods that, um, some flavors, some spices that are not typical of Sicilian cooking. They come from places like India or uh, North Africa. And now um, they're starting to be combined into our local dishes. I think, I think things are gonna change, especially now that we have so many people living here, um, new immigrants, okay, uh, who are part of our society today. Your, your children are speaking Sicilian, they're going to, to school with Sicilian children. And, um, and it's so normal, okay? <laughs> So normal. Yeah, we have a question here that actually is a great question for you because you and I've had this conversation. Um, some, somebody says, I'm learning Italian using Duolingo. How close would that Italian be to Sicilian Italian? And I'm just going to start right off. And <laughs> before you even say it, because we've yeah, talked about this, <laughs> is that Sicilian Italian, those are two separate languages. So you can't Precisely. say the dialect. It's not a dialect. It is recognized as its own language. And uh, last time that you and I were, were together, you told me that that is starting to be taught in schools again. So they're working on teaching Sicilian in school. At the moment, children in school study Sicilian poetry, some Sicilian novels like The Leopard, Pigato Bardo. Um, so, but um, teachers are being trained uh, or they were supposed to be trained and uh, COVID-19 arrived, but they're supposed to be trained or trying to train them to teach Sicilian, which has a separate grammar. That's the difficulty. And, and then Sicilian is a separate language with its own grammar, but throughout the island, there's something like 25 or, 25 or more different dialects of Sicilian that are spoken. Okay, so the grammar is more or less the same, but the words change, verbs, nouns, um, they change completely. Okay, so um, it's, it's, it's tough. And, and so, and it has, it has nothing to do with Italian except for the fact that there's a lot of Latin in Italian and Sicilian, uh, but Sicilian then becomes very more, it becomes more complicated because, because you have words in Arabic and some words in Hebrew, in, in German, medieval German, uh, Norman French, uh, and then of course other languages that have more of a Latin base, like Catalan that has Latin and Arabic. Um, so it's a mix. It's a, it's quite a mix. And I would just say, from my my personal experience, spending a lot of time around people who are speaking dialect, I can't understand it, but I can make it out. I can kind of I, I understand the gist of what people are saying with because of my ability in Italian, but. The interesting thing, I went to Morocco and I'm listening to people speaking Arabic and all of a sudden, just like this weird flash of lightning, I just went, Flicks. I understand what people are saying in Arabic. Why do I understand Arabic? And it was, I, and absolutely, I've traced it back to my experiences listening to people and trying to, to decipher Sicilian. Right. Similar very much, I would say, to the experience I had in Romania this last year, which is Romanian is a, a, a completely foreign language to me. I have no association with it, but I could understand the gist of it because it's a Latin-based language. The Latin, sure. Yeah. Yeah, so once, once you kind of get one key language down, it's so fun. It's almost like surfing the waves of the radio, you know, and you, you kind of tune it in and you kind of go, oh, I think I understand. But yeah, that was a real shock to me when I went to Morocco that I could actually vaguely right. understand conversations. 
<laughs> you know, I tried studying Japanese years ago. I did two years of Japanese lessons oh. and I, I thought I didn't understand anything. And then I started listening to people speak Japanese and it's like, I understood the gist of it. And at that point I thought I'm making progress. <laughs> okay. But then I stopped it. This was many years ago. It's such a difficult language. You really have to live in Japan for many years. Yeah. Um, to learn Japanese. My younger son is studying Japanese right now. So yeah, I, I, he could have done Spanish or Japanese and, he, and I, I can speak Spanish. I, I, I can't help him with his homework. No. <laughs> it's like, sorry. I, I, I understand a lot of different languages a little bit, but that's not one of them. So, um, so what is your current project? What are you working on right now? Well, I just finished um, on a couple of eBooks. Okay, the, the last one is called uh, Sicilian court culture from 1061 to 1266, which is actually a lot of it is taken from uh, two of my more recent books, Queens of Sicily and Sicilian Queenship, Power and Identity. Um, but what I took from there is all, all the, the chapter dedicated to cuisine, medieval cuisine at, at, um, me, at medieval courts of Sicily, um, poetry, Sicilian poetry, uh, which is, I love Sicilian poetry. I've always been fascinated by it. And I've done a number of uh, translations of poems from Sicilian into English, in some cases for the first time. And life in general at court. Okay, so that's something I just finished. Um, and I also finished a project on a, okay, it's not a guidebook like Rick Steve's guidebook, obviously not, but it's a historical guidebook of Sicily. So I don't talk about hotels. I don't talk about um, admission or um, you know time schedules. I just talk about the sites historically. Okay, Lucky you, because my, my guidebook is a mess now. <laughs> no, this is something else. It's a historical <laughs> guide of, of Sicily. Um, but anything new? Um, I was hoping to work, maybe I will, before the lockdown ends completely on a general history of Sicily. Okay, that's, that's, it's an idea that's up there, but I haven't started, I haven't really started on it yet. <laughs> well, like a traveler's history of Sicily would be a really useful, that would be a really helpful text, I think, uh, because it really, yeah. I mean, I think that what we wrote is a great start, uh, and, but it just made me realize in writing the guidebook that there were so many subtopics that we could have written a lot yeah. about, and that was really, I think the difficulty for me is where do you stop? Because it's like a rabbit hole. Every single little thing you want to talk about in Sicily, oh, I think I want to talk about. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Oh, volumes. I got really, really interested in the, the, Greek, um, the, the Greek connection and the Peloponnesian War, and I went back and I read Homer, and I'm like kind of going, and I just realized I was going down all of these rabbit holes, reading Thucydides again. I have Thucydides from when I was in Thucydides. college, so that I go back and I start reading Thucydides, and I'm like, this and is then... going to be great for the, the guidebook, and then I went, oh, this is too much. <laughs> Yeah, no, it's too much. <laughs> I <Yeah>. know. <laughs> so th this is the, the thing about Sicily is once you get the passion for it, once you get the fever, it's, it's one of these things that, I mean, I think for me, it's going to be an area of study for the rest of my life because there's plenty to keep you occupied, don't you think? Yes, I think so. I, I think so. And I have a lot of ideas for book projects. It's just that, <laughs> I don't know. But I've got a lot of books out there. Okay, so, <laughs> so uh, I think I... I've been contributing. <laughs> Somebody's asking me if I would be willing to post the Amazon link uh, to your books. I will absolutely do that. So I will yes, go ahead and post some links for, for Jackie so that you can um, pick up some of her books because they really yeah. are fascinating and they're such easy reads. They're really, it's a great That's writing stressful. style. Yeah, I really appreciate your writing style because having read the dry books out there about Sicilian history that make you fall asleep, it's really refreshing to read one that actually is it more in a storyteller format that's easy to to digest so yeah my real my real goal in in my books is always that I, i'm in love with sicily and i want others to fall in love with it okay so that's why the reading has to be easy even if even if some of the some of the topics are a little complicated okay yeah well as a as a sister in passion with sicily i understand that um so I think a lot of people have seen, at least I've been forwarded by everybody on earth, this article saying that Sicily is going to pay for people to take a vacation there. And I, I am skeptical that that's true. What have you heard about that? 
Okay, so um, it's a Sicilian um, a Sicilian project, and in the past couple of weeks, the Sicilian Parliament has been meeting because we have parliamentary sessions in Sicily, separate from uh, Roman Parliament, and they've been meeting to decide what to put together in what we call in Italian a decreto. It's a type of bill that needs to pass. Uh, but uh, one of the main things that we're focusing on to get our economy um, started, starting again after this horrible lockdown is tourism. Okay, so how are we going to get people here? Well, already um, some companies are opening up resorts at the end of May. By June, it, by June, our beaches will be open. And, and so we hope that even though many preca precautions are being taken, uh, you know, social distancing, even at the beach and at resorts, uh, we're hoping that more and more people will start to come, especially when flights start again, um, besides uh, flights, because at the moment it's just domestic tourism, just national with Italy. But we, we hope that by maybe late summer, uh, flights will start again. Um, so what is the uh, part of this bill that, that, that's supposed to pass in Sicily? Um, if you spend three nights in Sicily, the Sicilian region will get will will uh, pay for the third night. Okay, so I I'm assuming that if you're spending six nights, two nights will be paid by the region. Okay, then uh, the region is also going to. They say that they're going to give out vouchers to travel companies in Sicily. Uh, to pay for the guides and to pay for these extra nights at the hotels. So it's all to be seen, okay? If they say that they're gonna do it, they'll do it. I just don't know how, how the workings, will, how it's gonna work out because this bill still has to pass. Okay, but stay posted. Well, <laughs> and if and I find something, I'll send it to you. Yeah, and please do send it to me. And I, I'd like to keep my people posted on my blog, but also uh, in the back of my mind, I would like to just put even together a spontaneous tour to Sicily, you know, just gather eight or yeah. 10 people and come down and have you show us around. And because uh, I think that if it opens up, I would just love to just like be on the spot and be able to go down and take people back to Sicily because I think that's uh, that's great. And obviously from my end, I have such a passion. I'd like to promote uh, Sicily as much as I possibly can by having you on. And I, I'm going to probably talk to our mutual friend Alvina as well. So uh, <laughs> whatever we can do to get people back to the island because uh, I think a concern and something that I have read in the, the media is there is this kind of vague concern that there could be a resurgence in the mafia due to this situation. Do you have a feeling about that or have you heard about that? Um, it's something that our government, even the central government, is uh, keeping. It, it, it's, there's an, an alert out in the sense that everybody is trying to be careful that this does not happen. Um, how would the mafia uh, have a comeback um, if um, we don't get any national help for people who have lost their jobs because of, of the lockdown? It's not just Sicily, it's the entire South, from Naples South, okay. Um, but the government is working on uh, giving assistance and help, even with people who had, um, you know, jobs without a contract, okay. <laughs> um, how do you say it in English? Um, uh, under, uh, undocumented under, workers. Uh, undocumented workers, and there's a, there was a lot of, of that um, in Sicily and in Italy, and um, but these people are getting at least small subsidies so that they, they could buy food, they could pay their bills. Um, and even, but yeah, it, you know, we've, we've been, the fight against the mafia has been drastic and hard and long, as you know. Um, I've even lost friends, uh, actually not friends, but um, fr some friends of mine have lost their, their parents because their parents were fighting against the mafia, they were protecting um, judges, and they were, or they were part of police forces who were fighting against the mafia. So we don't want to go back to those dark days, uh, the 80s and early 90s, and I'm sure that won't happen. But um, if, if we're not careful, um, you know, it's very difficult for some, some businesses to get a loan. Uh, I've, I've heard 
um, that my favorite pizza place in Palermo is closing. Which one? The uh, Perciasacchi. Oh. Perciasacchi at, in, uh, in front of the in Via Monte di Pietà near the Capo Market. And they were using, you know, those special Sicilian types of flour, like tuminia, uh, wheat. And, and Mrs. Uh, Renata, the owner, said, she was on the news the other day saying, I'm closing. I already uh, fired all my employees and I'm closing my place. And she was in tears. Okay, so that's one of the many businesses that will close. Okay. Um, and some people to avoid closing, um, if they feel that it's it, it, because of all the red tape uh, that it takes in a bank to get a loan in Italy, and you, you, you might be aware of this, it's really tough. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. uh, unfortunately, some people will go uh, to the mafia uh, or to people connected to the mafia to get money, to get a loan, okay? And hopefully that doesn't happen. And that's why the government right now in Rome, they're working on passing a bill that will um, subsidize, subsidize these businesses, even small businesses, cafes, restaurants, and um, give uh, out loans to them that, um, that are um, with zero, uh, one percent or zero percent um, taxes, and not taxes, what do you call it? Um, interest. Interest. Yeah. Okay. So we'll see what happens. Well, I hope that that works out because, you know, that obviously is the thing that I've been concerned about is that so many of these places, restaurants that I, you know, it's taken me and, and Alfio years to, to find the right restaurants and hotels Sarah, and gonna, all these things. And it's all gone. Some places, <laughs> won't, some places will yeah. not reopen. Imagine. It's tough on people like me. Uh, I'm a guide. I've been working for many years as a guide. Yeah, I write, but I, I usually I make more my money from guiding than writing, okay? Yeah. Um, because that's how it is with books and writing, and um, it's tough on me. Yeah. And I'm I'm sure that when this is all over, uh, let's say March or May of next year, uh, tourism goes back to normal, okay, more or less. I'm sure that I many of my colleagues won't be out there anymore, and many of the cafes and restaurants where I used to to go on my own or with friends or with visitors, with tourists, they're gone. Wow. They're going to be gone. What a shame. It's going to be a whole different world out there. I've been thinking about you and thinking about Palermo just because Palermo has had such an incredible transformation in the time that I've been going over the last 10 years. It was great. Yeah, it's been, it's had a renaissance and it was, I mean, the first time I went to Palermo, I, I was a little shocked because it was definitely rougher around the edges than any place, place else I'd been in Italy. And now it's absolutely magnificent. It's so gorgeous. And they've done, had so many initiatives to make it really right. a cultural capital. And so it's really, my heart aches. Will, Some of it will come back, I'm sure. I, so. I mean, also because the, the wonderful thing is that the first thing that our local government in Sicily mentioned uh, is that once the lockdown is over, um, tourism, will will try to get tourism back uh, on its way. Uh, we'll, Good. we'll start up with that again. So keep our fingers crossed and <laughs> we'll see. Yeah. Well, I hope that that's the case. Well, thank you so much, Jackie, for joining us today. Uh, I thank always you, love Sarah, talking for inviting to you. me. <laughs> <laughs> she is just a wealth of knowledge and I, we always have such interesting conversations. I'm sure that we could keep talking for hours. So we'll, we'll leave it there for now, but uh, hopefully we'll catch up with you again another time and we can have another conversation. Yes, Sarah, I look forward to that. And I would love to care do that. And goodbye, everybody. Thanks for joining. Okay. <laughs> Grazie mille. And to those Ciao. who have asked about this, um, I had a question about uh, uh, Jackie's book as well as other books that, that we have to recommend on Sicily. I will compile a list and I'll be sure to post it on Facebook and also on my blog with, with appropriate links uh, to support That's our terrible. writers because <clears throat> part, of, just part of what I'm doing this for is that I want to promote people I care about who I think do good work and all of us tour guides are out of work right now. So if you can support an excellent artist and author like Jackie, I would really appreciate it if you would. And you'll learn something wonderful at the same time. So. And all I'll right. be back. <laughs> Bye. Ciao, my dear. I'll Ciao. talk to you again soon. Goodbye, everybody. Have Ciao. a great day. Bye, everybody. Bye.